This episode is brought to you by the MJ family of companies. Whatever interests you in the cannabis community can be found at MJ.com. Unique and original content updating you on the latest trends in marijuana legalization, businesses and executives that are disrupting the industry, along with recreational entertainment and the latest deals on the brands and products you love. Visit MJ.com today. Welcome to the Pot Live Podcast. I'm your host, Lenny G, and I can't believe it. We've already broken through 100 episodes. We want to thank you, the listeners, thousands of you that have sent beautiful comments, beautiful notes to us. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoy it. This next year, we're going to bring you the thought leaders, entertainers, trailblazers, CEOs of all the cannabis companies you want to hear from people that are inventing new products, people that are bringing this cannabis industry to the mainstream. We are gonna offer you education, value, and entertainment. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. And we are back with my main man, Matthew Carr of Profit Trends of the Oxford Club. He's back again on the Pot Live podcast. Matthew, welcome to the show. Hey, as always, thanks for having me back, Len. Excellent. Love having you on every couple of months so we can get a little state of the union in the cannabis stock world, if you will. So since we last spoke during the summer and we're recording this now in the fall of 2021, give us a little update on where we, where we are with the Safe Banking Act and with the MORE Act compared to where we were maybe earlier in the year. Uh, okay, so recently we did have the, the MORE Act pass the House Judiciary Committee and we had the Safe Banking Act, which is included in the NDAA, the the military spending bill. No surprise there. The MORE Act was was introduced into the House last year and passed, but you know procedurally had to be reintroduced for it to be voted on this year and then to move forward to the Senate. The Safe Banking Act, I'll, I'll tackle that first because this is the act that would allow cannabis companies to access to the same, you know, financial services that every other industry in this country enjoys mean, instead well. of a concrete building with an armed guard out front <laughs> exactly <laughs> dealing all in cash and then yeah having to pay all these people all of the, the security guard uh companies these, these fees now this being included in the the military spending bill it's not going to pass the senate because the senate version of the bill doesn't have that this amendment in there but i do want to say kind of something that I really like Morgan Fox from the NCIA had said recently that these passages by both the Moore Act and the Safe Banking Act, don't think of them as just kind of symbolic, right? Don't think of them as a, as these sort of gestures by the House that are ultimately going to fail in the Senate because it does kind of keep the conversation going on legalization or a change in the cannabis industry. And that's something that actually really needs to happen because we have all of these states that have legalized recreational use, that have legalized medicinal use, will likely have more in the future. But there does need to be a change at the federal level. And right now, there is this sort of stonewall from, from one party to, to not have any sort of, uh, to, to even <laughs> have a vote on any of these measures. So there has to be a way forward here. And if we keep kind of bringing these bills forward and keep, and the House keeps passing them, it kind of keeps the dialogue going that there will eventually be some bridge discovered that then we can then move forward. So that to me is, is you know, these bills passing, not too surprising in the House. They're, the likelihood of them, again, advancing in the Senate, unfortunately, kind of bleak. At, at the moment, which, you know, that, of course, is weighing on <laughs> the entire cannabis market. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, as someone, I'm, I'm going to play a little, or maybe it's not devil's advocate because you kind of just alluded to it, but I'm basically, as an owner of several cannabis investments, online assets um, and platforms, you know, COVID has really put a delay into the industry. When we thought, I, I remember when we first started talking, um, during the election year before COVID, we talked, you know, leading up to the election, we talked about, is this going to be at the top of the ballot? Are they going to talk about this in the debates? Are they going to talk about this going, going forward? With, is a new administration going to be huge for the cannabis industry? And we all thought, yeah, absolutely. 
And then boom, everyone gets smacked in the face with COVID. A lot of businesses aren't able to, you know, fulfill their promise. A lot of these, you know, stocks now have swooned since their highs of earlier this year or when, when people thought legalization was definitely going to happen. You know, how do you talk to investors out there that have, you know, been waiting and thought those February highs were going to continue and now we're back down to, you know, not really attractive levels as a long portfolio holder, but maybe attractive for the future as a buyer. So first thing when I talk to investors about the cannabis industry, it's always to keep in mind, since it's still illegal at the federal level here in the United States, that not to focus on, you know, the next quarterly report or, you know, the next month or the next year, that you really have to take this multi-year long-term mindset. What is this world going to be like five years from now, you know, 10 years from now? Where are we going to still have it? These same issues, probably not as as, <laughs> as divisive as they are now. Because because of, and that's simply because of the the amount of headway we've made in the last ten years. I mean, think about like you know Colorado and Oregon when they first legalized uh, recreational. That wasn't even a decade ago. So that's that's the first thing. Take that mindset that this is a long-term hold and uh, you want to you know, add to your position at attractive prices. Don't get swept up in you know, kind of the lows of the moment. You know, again, I have you know, cannabis holdings that <laughs> there are times that you just don't even you know, concern yourself about that in your portfolio because again, this is a, this is a, a long-term thing. Now, I also like at this level, no one wants to talk about cannabis. No one wants to talk about cannabis stocks. No one wants to talk about cannabis investing. And all of these stocks are at these lows that are pretty, <laughs> um, pretty again, pretty attractive as a buyer. But you know, if you bought them in February or you bought them maybe in January. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're not attractive if you've been holding them since March or February yeah. or March. Yeah. Exactly. Not as attractive, but but right now if you're looking to get reintroduced, this is a great level. I like it. especially, you know, taking that that long term view, especially in the Canadian companies with like uh leaps, because I think you can't do that with uh, you know, the 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 US or at least not here in the United States with the, the US multi-state operators because they trade OTC. But you can do that with with the, the Canadian operators that are trading on major exchanges because these lows at the moment, that's not because of growth, right? It's it's not because of of market share. It this is the political headwinds that the entire industry is facing and that once again setting in at the moment that our legalization is going to take a little bit longer than we originally thought. Yeah, I just read an article, actually, I think it was on Investors Business Daily, and they, they said that they don't think legalization is going to happen anytime soon now because they're afraid of the social equity negative effects it would have for some of the small businesses and minority-owned businesses that if they go fully federally legal, the big corps are just going to blow all these little businesses out, number one. And during this time where everyone's very sensitive to all the social equity movements, um, and social justice movements, they're kind of almost afraid to watch all these people get blown out in an industry by the big boys when, when everything already, nobody's trusting any government, anything right now. So sure. it, it, I read something and that was the tone of the article and it did make sense. Yeah. And, that, and that's very difficult. Now, I do believe that the M&A activity is going to pick up. Once again, we're at these lows. Uh, you're going to start seeing more of these bigger players gobble up smaller companies. There ultimately will be, you know, a, a much larger consolidation in the industry. There just kind of has to be. It'd be nice to have all of these brands, but I think a lot of them are going to probably end up being brought under larger umbrellas. Now, I don't know if it'll be like Bruce Linton said several years ago that it'll ultimately only be a half dozen cannabis companies, <laughs> but I think it'll probably lean closer to that because because you will see the uh, a continued consolidation. So what's, what's the strategy for an investor in your opinion right now? Is it trying to pick some of those targets that will be acquired, some of the smaller companies, or is it to just have a core portfolio of the ones you think will survive and be that half dozen uh, behemoths in the industry? So for me, I would do core portfolio of the behemoths that are going to really do well. Again, I always remind like everybody what those are. 
I, I like CureLeaf just because it's the largest multi-state operator in the U.S. Uh, Cresco, which is the largest wholesale operator, as well as it has its own brands in the U.S. Those are both companies that I like long-term. And then you have a company like TrueLeaf, which is just uh, expanding beyond Florida, continuing that that strategy, but is is one of the most profitable companies in the space. So I like those three for the U.S. As I said earlier, for the Canadians, I mean, I have a, a sort of a, <laughs> a a personal thing. Anytime Canopy falls below fifteen dollars over the last couple of years, that to me is a buy because you know that as the cannabis market moves in these, you know, really extreme bear and bull markets, very similar to cryptocurrencies, right? It's a, it's a, it's a nascent market. It does have its volatility. It's going to have these high highs and then these, these deep lows right now we're in this <laughs> and one of these, these deep lows, it will bounce back. So I like canopy and Tilray. I mean, $10 on Tilray, you know, 1350 on canopy. And then sort of taking that approach of leaps on those, like these long dated calls, 2023, you know, maybe even 2024. Yeah, I've, I've actually done exactly what you've described on both of those securities. This yeah, because that's two years. Yep. Yeah, because that's a that's a way that you can you can kind of snag a, a larger position there. Again, there's risk with all options trading as well as any investment. I'm just buying shares, but the upside there is, is so much more. Do I think Canopy trades at thirteen dollars a year, two years from now? I do not believe so. <laughs> be a, I be, think that was the bottom last time was around the same level, right? Because I remember I, I think I first got in at thirteen or fourteen last time. It ran up to the forties, and I actually dumped about eighty percent of it. Still have a little bit left, um, but yeah, it does do. It has some sort of a uh, pattern to it when the momentum goes, you know. Yeah, and this is going to kind of enter sort of the busy year in, in Canada for a lot of those those companies. And again, we have this rollout not only uh, in Canada of those cannabis 2.0 products, the the concentrates, the drinks, the edibles, but you also have that market here in the U.S. And I think that is a, a market that has a lot higher profit margins than just selling flour, and that is going to ultimately attract a much larger audience. I still think right now, smoking, there is some hesitancy because of what we know from the cigarette industry, the tobacco industry, that ultimately that's bad um, long term, though with cannabis, we know that it doesn't have the, the, same, uh, the same issues. But I think there's, from a consumer standpoint, people are more open to a beverage that they can drink or an edible, something that they can kind of control and kind of nibble at and feel more comfortable as an as an uh, entry into this market. I agree, especially with COVID as well. People relate that with a lung disease and people are, might be more hesitant to, you know, put anything in their lungs and might want to try an edible or topical or, or a, you know, beverage like you said as well. Yeah, and so and that and that to me also goes back to why you'd see M and A because the the larger companies, especially on those sort of mass produced concentrate products, the advantage of a larger company is that manufacturing process can be more um, sort of controlled at a much smaller level. You can have a lot of variance from you know, let's say product to product or like can to can, even though they're all, all the same line. On the manufacturing, a large scale manufacturing side, it'd be a little bit more controlled. And I think ultimately that's something the industry will probably likely face some sort of, you know, like the THC levels. Yeah. All right. So give everyone, please, a cannabis stock that you've been watching besides the big boys you just mentioned that has really been depressed in share price since it's February highs that you love the company and it's, it's a long-term hold in your portfolio no matter what the price does in the short term. Oh man, that's a, that's a, <laughs> that's a tough one. I, you know, I still like Grogen. I can't believe Grogen's at 23 right now. Yeah. I think, you know, that's, a, that's an ancillary play on the industry, but I do like that at this level because I, 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 I think there's, 
a lot of up, our upside there is getting dragged down by a lot of the rest of the industry. You can see right now that there is an investor sort of desire for cannabis stocks in the term and how innovative industrial properties. That, I, that yeah. one's still been doing well, right? That price yeah. is basically going up this year still. Yeah, we, we, it just came off 52, uh, 52 week highs, all time highs. Yeah, incredible. <laughs> because, and that's because of that dividend payment, right? right. That people want exposure and, and that always served as a, as a, as a safety. Uh, so safety once net. again, we've talked about it in the past. It's basically a real estate play with a dividend. Can you just explain what that company is real quick again? Yeah, so it is a, a company that does, uh, it buys industrial real estate in areas uh, and then leases it back to a lot of cannabis companies and then they'll pay rent as, as well as, you know, innovative industrial also set up money for improvements. But the great thing there is a lot of these deals are um, 100% of its square footage is already leased. It is continuing to expand its operations into every state. So as the market expands, it's able to go into these new markets and buy real estate. It's got plenty of, of, of customers to, to, that need grow space to sell to. Uh, and then pays this you know healthy dividend of nearly six bucks a share. So, yeah, that, yeah, that's the one I've always been kicking myself about since we've been talking for the last couple of years. Is that's the one I did not purchase. <laughs> that <laughs> one's been going up the whole time, of course. But I did kill it on Grogen. You gave me Grogen at like seven bucks, and I sold it in the fifties or something. Yeah. Like that. So I made a killing on that. But IIPR, which is Industrial uh, Innovative Properties, um, for everyone out there. That one I did not buy, Matthew. So I kicked myself about that one. <laughs> yeah, that I, I think any time that that has a has a sort of a step back, it's kind of good to maybe start building a little bit more of a position because when you see the markets, the larger cannabis market sour like it has recently, all that money will flow into IIPR and continue to 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 boost it because all those investors want this exposure and they want the safety though. They don't want to take on this extra risk. Yeah, and but, I, mean, I think the with Grogen for everyone out there who maybe missed the previous episodes and in, and industrial innovative, these are like ancillary plays for the cannabis market. So one was what uh, Matthew just described. Grow Generation is more of a hydroponics company, um, similar to like Hydro Farm. I think is another one. And yeah. I know I'm a uh, I'm an angel investor in one that's going public this year as well that I can't mention the name of yet. So I'm excited about that. But that's a way to play the market without touching the weed stocks, if you will, correct? Right. And they, they, they also trade on the major exchanges here in the U.S. And so that gives you a lot more flexibility in terms of not only just buying shares, they're more liquid. Um, and then you can also buy options, right? So you can kind of boost your returns on those. Yeah. All right. So um, before we finish with one last question, please tell everyone where... They can find you. Matthew doesn't just do cannabis stocks. He does all sorts of different investing uh, advice and groups. So tell everyone where they can find you or contact your team. Uh, yeah, you can check us out at ProfitTrends.com as well as Profit Trends on Instagram, Matthew S. Carr on Twitter, as well, and uh, Market Trends on YouTube, which is also Profit Trends. Those are all the things that we do every single week. He's a busy man, ladies and gentlemen. He's a busy man. All right, so give us maybe give us one stock you've been looking at in the cannabis industry that we really haven't discussed in the past um, or something that you're keeping your eye on um, at this time. Is there anything new, a, a new security that we haven't discussed really? Well, I've, I've been watching uh, Columbia Care. I really like this company. Um, it's sort of like the kind of unsung MSO. It has a fairly large presence up there com comparable with, with Green Thumb, uh, Cure Leaf, Cresco, but it flies under a lot of people's radars. A lot of these companies that are in that sort of second tier in the MSOs, these are where they're seeing their triple digit growth this year, that they didn't enjoy uh, the triple digit growth that you know, Cure Leaf and Cresco and Truly and Green Thumb all saw last year because um, they were building up their sort of uh, business. These are the years that they're really gonna take off. So I like Columbia Care, uh, Jushi, which I've talked about before. I like that company too. Um, nice exposure to Pennsylvania. So Columbia Care is more in the, the New York, New Jersey markets, uh, Jushi in Pennsylvania. Those East Coast markets are, are, are very important for, for the cannabis industry. 
Excellent. Well, Matthew, as always, thank you uh, for being back on the show. Maybe we'll do a little holiday update around year end. And uh, thanks again. And we will talk to you next time, my friend. All right. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Lynn. All right. And we will see everyone next time on the Pot Live Podcast. If you are into the recreational side of the cannabis industry, yes, stoners, I'm talking to you. Then the pot.com is the online and mobile destination for you. That's right. T H E P O T.com. The pot.com. Where else can you find the exclusive pot made of the month? Take a pot quiz and win prizes. Scroll through hilarious memes and jokes and check out the latest podcasts, news, and trends, all while having your own profile and voice in the pot.com forum. Visit thepot.com today and get lit.